Good morning. I need a new propeller for a BZ-52. Do you have one in stock? Ah, oh, I don't know, mate. Let me check. BZ-52 propeller. No. Oh, no BZ-52 propeller in stock. Aha. Do you have a RT-12 propeller in stock? An RT-12? Let me look. No, we're completely out of RT-12 propellers. Do you have any propellers in stock? Let me look. What was it? Propellers? No, we're completely out of all propellers. Hmm. And that, my friends, was the birth of an idea, if you excuse the bad acting, of a concept that changed modern warfare. In the past, going way back to the medieval times, and certainly in World War I, if you pushed your army forward, thousands of men would die to gain a few meters of the front line. But because of an unfortunate lack of propellers at the US Air Force maintenance stores, a brilliant idea was born. It all began due to a flood. <laughs> Two rivers in Philadelphia flooded their banks. Just down a river from Philadelphia is a factory that makes propellers. In fact, they made all the propellers for the US Air Force, every single one. And when the river flooded, their factory was destroyed. Now, trainee pilots, and I should know, <laughs> bend propellers. And an airplane without a propeller is useless. So when the US Air Force Maintenance Department tried to replace the bent propellers, they found there was none to have. That terrible occurrence, but simple idea, was brilliant. Meanwhile, back in Blighty, the Royal Air Force in World War II would carpet bomb a city, possibly destroying the factory, but also the dairy and all the other houses. It was terrible and such a waste, but they could do it at night from 30,000 feet. Wouldn't it be better if you could target your bombs more accurately. And that's where the inspiration from the missing propellers came in. If you can take out the one element that destroys a weapon, you've won the war. Meanwhile, in a small workshop in Bavaria, Hans is pouring special glass into a mold that makes the glass in the periscopes of every U-boat. In the Ruhr Valley, a specialized steel plant is making extra hard ball bearings that ones that Panzer tanks need in their drive shaft. Not any old ball bearing, but the specialized hardened steel ones. The ball bearings that make the tank work. Aha! If you could drop a bomb onto Hans's glass factory, you've wiped out the U-boats. A submarine has engines, it has torpedoes. It's a boat that goes underwater. But if you don't have a periscope to target your ships, it's useless. And a panzer tank rolling over the fields of Poland would break down if it didn't have the ball bearings in its ball race. So the concept of targeted bombing was born. But how do you do it? You all know the biggest, most famous inventions of World War II. Radar, the atomic bomb, the proximity fuse, if you remember my film on that. But there was one device 
that changed modern warfare, and that was the bombsite. The Norden bombsite was the most expensive contract given to any individual in World War II. Boeing were given millions to build airplanes. Ford were given millions to build tanks. But Carl Norden, a Dutch-born Swiss-trained engineer, was given more money as an individual than anybody else in World War II. He claimed to have a device that could drop a bomb in a pickle barrel from 30,000 feet. It's an extremely famous device, but do you know anything about Carl? Uh, no. And that's because he is regarded as the most difficult person in the world to work with. He was rude to his bosses and rude to all his workers. And in the end, it all went horribly wrong for Carl. But I suppose he was a genius. The problem he claimed to have solved was this. And I'm going to set this as a task for you to do today. Drive down the road in your car at 60 miles an hour holding a golf ball. And when you approach a 65 mile an hour round speed limit sign, wind the window down and throw the golf ball out from the moving car so it hits the sign. Um, think about it. The speed of the car, the wind, the weight of the golf ball, the size and position of the target, and that's just the obvious ones. It's mind-boggling to make a device that would drop a bomb in a pickle barrel. And, oh, hang on a minute, I forgot. Breakfast of the day is a Lolite cappuccino and a Mrs. H apple cinnamon bread. Mm. Carl, despite being the most miserable person in the world, was a genius. He made a computer that could drop a bomb. But hang on everybody, this is 1940. There weren't any computers. Well, there were. There were things called analog computers that use cogs and gears and could do one thing really well. You just had to keep them oiled and cleaned and they worked forever without electricity. So Carl came up with this. Of course, it has to be named after him, the Norden Bombsite. But it was impossibly hard to work. Miserable Mr. Norden boiled down the problem of dropping the bomb into the pickle barrel to only 64 major corrections. Here's a clip from the US Air Force easy to understand training clip for bombardiers. Boy! And here's your sight. What's the matter? Too many gimmicks? Well, they're all important. Every one of those switches and knobs. And by golly, you'll learn to know what they're for before we're through. From the leveling system to the stabilizer. And from the switches to the knobs. What you're going to find out now is what makes what do what. It was a long course, and I bet a few flunked it. But the ones who passed had to swear an oath. And that was the oath to never let the Norden bombsite get into enemy hands. In the case it came in from the stores were three sticks of explosives. If ever the bombsite was compromised, you were instructed to blow it up, even if it meant losing the aircraft and your own life. It was World War II's most secret device, and it was fiendishly hard to use. What is your drift angle? 12 degrees right. 35 mils at 7 o'clock. 
What's the matter? Expecting to hit it on the nose on your first run? Pretty good. Try it again. Again and again and again. Several hundred times again. We're not paying off on one hit out of 50. Not in this man's Air Force. Literally, there were dozens of parameters you had to set as the bombardier to hit the target. And remember, you're flying in a plane being attacked by fighters and flak and making evasive maneuvers all the time. Everything that changed, the speed, the height, the density, the weight of the bomb, the position of the target. Ah! you had to set on the Norden bombsite. So, did it work? Kind of. Tune in for part two on the Norden bombsite. <laughs>